Bibles today, the book of John, in chapter number 14, John chapter number 14, thank you so very much for that song today. Um, expressing at least the sentiment of developing um, an affectionate heart towards the Lord, having a, 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 a closeness and intimacy with the Lord. I just wanted you to know, just wanted to talk to you, Lord. And uh, I, I think we need to be fervent and earnest and urgent in our prayers, but I also think we need to be um, um, friendly and close in our prayers, close to the Lord. If you found John chapter 14, I'd like to invite you to stand today. John chapter 14, I'm going to start with verses 1 through 3. It's probably like the most familiar passage of Scripture ever. But uh, I'm not going to, and, and I am going to preach on this passage. We're going to go, go through almost the entire chapter as a part of the message today. So we're not going to uh, speak so much on um, the return of the Lord. That's going to be one little aspect of the message. But, um, uh, but I want to deal with the subject. I'm going to call today the untroubled heart the untroubled heart. So in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus is the one speaking. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so that's all real familiar. I wanted you to skip down with me to verse 27. One more verse here, verse, John 14, verse 27. And Jesus continues to, by saying, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And then he says this, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I want to ask you now that your Holy Spirit will bless as we begin to look into your word, and especially this chapter, uh, we'll see some other things today too, but especially from this chapter. And I want to pray, Heavenly Father, that you would, um, that you would establish our hearts, that you will strengthen our hearts, that you will um, give us an untroubled heart at the things that are going on in, uh, around us in the world, and especially in the sense of how those things affect us personally, I pray that you'd help us to have an untroubled heart. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd help us to be concerned about the things that we ought to be concerned about, and, um, but that we would be untroubled about the things um, that, um, that, that, are, that are your business, that are your concern. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to, as I said, speak on the subject today, the untroubled heart. And as I begin, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. In fact, he says it twice in this chapter. Let not your heart be troubled. And I think as I begin this message, I need to, I need to start out, first of all, by, by saying what he's not saying. When Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, Troubled, he is not saying that it is a sin to be troubled or afraid. It's not a sin to be troubled or afraid. He says in verse 27, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The two are closely connected, troubled or afraid. But it is not necessarily a sin to have fear in your life. To be troubled, have fear in your life. I, I know most everyone here has heard this story. In fact, it seems to me like I might have told this not very long ago. I told it, given this story in one of the messages, you know, the story about the guy in Astoria who heard me say, you know, I confess that I was afraid of bees. And, um, and it, it bothered him terribly that I am afraid of bees, you know. And so he came to me uh, with a couple of scriptures, showed me a couple of scriptures. First, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And if you had the spirit of God in you, you wouldn't be afraid of bees. And uh, so he was very concerned about that, that if you had the spirit of God in you, you could have the power to overcome fear of bees. Uh, if you had the spirit of God in you, you would love bees. If you had the spirit of God in you, uh, you wouldn't get freaked out when you see a bee, and uh, he gave me that verse, and, and then he also quoted, you know, uh, 
1 John 4, verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect. If you're afraid of bees, it means that you're not perfect in your relationship with the Lord, and uh, so you need to overcome the fear of bees. And he set out to uh, you know, be uh, um, the evangelist for bees to convert me so that I would love bees. He began that work. But I just want to tell you today that, um, um, that the fear itself is not a sin. Fear itself is not a sin. In fact, Jesus specifically told us something to be afraid of. In John, I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that they have no more that they can do, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed uh, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. That's obviously the Lord. He tells us we ought to have a fear of God. Uh, Jesus said that a man ought, ought, to, uh, ought not to fear the one who just kills the body, but instead fear the one who, kill, who can take your life and cast you eternally into hell. He says, so there are some things that are, uh, I mean, there, there is some fear that's legitimate and right to do. The words fear and trouble, I just said this, uh, according to John chapter 14, verse 27, are very closely related. So when Jesus told the disciples to let not their heart be troubled, he didn't mean to say that, their heart, that, they, should, that they should never be troubled. So, in fact, Jesus himself was troubled from time to time. Um, I notice in, um, in John chapter 12 and verse 27, the Bible says, this is Jesus, says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but I say for this cause came I unto this hour. Jesus said, Now is my soul troubled. He had a troubled soul. The soul is that part of, of a man that connects with his surroundings, with the natural world that is around him. And in this case, the hour of Christ's betrayal by Judas Iscariot, his, his capture, his trial, uh, his crucifixion, all those things were drawing at hand. They're, they're, they're now at hand. Those things are happening. And Jesus says, um, have these things at hand, his, my soul, he said, is, um, is troubled over these things. Now, I want to set the record straight right now. Jesus was not troubled about the Father's plan. He was not troubled about giving his life on the cross. He was not troubled about going to the grave. He was not troubled about whether or not he would be resurrected once he was in the grave. Uh, his concern when he says, now is my soul troubled, it's not that I, I know what's going to happen to me. I know they're going to capture me. I know they're going to try me. I know they're going uh, to beat me and hurt me physically, and then they're going to crucify me, and I'm going to die, and I'm troubled by the fact that all of this is going to happen. That is not what he's saying. His concern, however, was that somehow Satan would prevent him from this hour. And that what he says in that verse, he says, shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, that is why I came for this hour. His concern was not that this would happen, that the crucifixion would happen. His concern was that somehow that um, uh, the devil would hinder the work of God in this crucifixion. What if, um, and I'm just throwing out some sup, sup, supposes for you, what if his disciples were able to, somehow to, res to mount a resistance and prevent his capture. We do know that one of his disciples took a sword with him up there uh, to, the, um, to, the Mount of, uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was captured. What if uh, more than one had taken swords? What if uh, there had been enough of them go up there that they were able to mount a resistance and, and somehow the soldiers that had come to capture Jesus that night uh, backed off and decided this wasn't an appropriate time, you know, what, for whatever reason, uh, decided, well, you know what, there's no reason, there's a, a resistance and there's no reason to get into a conflict that, uh, that impacts more people than just Jesus. If we can't take him quietly, if we can't just go and take him, uh, then uh, maybe we'll back off and we'll find out. What if they were somehow able uh, to mount a resistance and prevent Jesus from being captured? Or what if they were not able to prevent, what if they were not able to prevent the capture of Jesus, but they were maybe in a, instead um, of, uh, you know, making the, the soldiers back off, what if in 
instead, the soldiers just decided, fine, we're going to kill everybody right here in the garden. And what if they took Jesus' life there in the garden instead of uh, him going through all that was necessary for him to be the sacrifice for our sins? It required his um, examination. They had to examine to make sure there was no fault in him. It required his crucifixion. It re required that he was crucified uh, 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 between two. It required All of these things are required in the scriptures. What if somehow um, they were able to just make the soldiers mad enough they just killed everybody in the garden and Jesus was taken there? And when Jesus says his soul is troubled, he knows the devil doesn't want the salvation of souls to happen. He knows the devil would like to prevent this thing from happening. What if somehow God, the devil was able to prevent God from getting the glory um, that he ought to get uh, at the cross, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus knew, and, and because Jesus knew, knew, you and I know, that Satan can never actually prevent the plan of God. Really, all the devil ever does is really, he only participates in the plan of God, but he does try to prevent. The devil would like to stop God's plan, plans from being fulfilled. It is his it is his work. He'd like to hinder the plan of God. He'd like to hinder the glory of God. He'd like to, to be able to stop God's plan from coming to fruition. And, and you and I know that that can't happen, that instead all he does is participate in the plan of God. But it does make sense that we would become troubled in our soul that God, for God to be glorified. It ought to concern us when, when God isn't glorified in this world. It ought to be something that concerns us. And, and notice what Jesus did. Now is my soul troubled. And notice what Jesus did. Because his soul was troubled, he began to pray. He was praying. He was praying. You know, um, a troubled soul makes for fervent prayer. There's nothing wrong with having a troubled soul that God would be glorified and, and, and so desired, so concerned that God would be glorified in this world that you begin to pray for God's glory to happen, that you begin to pray for the plan of God to happen, for, that you begin to pray for the will of God to occur. There's nothing wrong with having a soul that is so concerned for the glory of God that you pray for God's glory to take place, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's nothing wrong. Remember, Jesus, not my will, thine be done. When he's prayed that, Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, thine be done. He's not praying, God, um, uh, you know, I'd rather not go to the cross. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Uh, I'd rather not go to the cross. So uh, just if it be your will, I'd rather not die here. That's not what he's praying at all. He's not praying, God, it's my will to live, but not my will, thine be done. He is praying that the devil not be able to take him before it's God's time praying for God to be glorified in this thing. And listen, there's nothing wrong at all for you to be praying. Say, God, I am praying for your will to be done. I am praying for you to be glorified in this world. I am praying for you to, for your name, for your son to be lifted up and for, and for your name to be honored and glorified in my life. I'm praying for that and in the lives of other people too. Let your soul be troubled about the devil's activity in the world. Let me just tell you, I mean, it ought to, it ought to trouble you that there is a devil alive and active. It ought to trouble you that there are people who are taken captive at his will. It ought to trouble you that there is a devil who uh, influences the, uh, the souls of men, the hearts of men, so that they aren't saved and so that they, uh, that they do things that are anti-God and, and um, anti-Bible. It ought to trouble you and it ought to trouble you enough that it brings you to pray and to pray fervently for those things. Jesus was troubled in his soul. Number two, Jesus, the Bible says, was troubled in his spirit. I think this is interesting, by the way. Um, he's troubled in his soul in um, John chapter uh, 12. He's troubled in his spirit in John chapter 13. And then he talks about the troubled heart in John chapter 14. I think it's just interesting how that develops like that. But Jesus' spirit was troubled in John 13 and verse 21. When Jesus had, uh, had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Jesus was troubled in his spirit when he testified that one of the twelve, his twelve apostles, one of those were going to be the ones who 
was going to be the one who betrayed him to be uh, crucified. Now, the soul is the part of man that connects with um, nature, with our surroundings. The spirit is that part of man that connects with God. So before a person is saved, the Bible says the spirit is dead and trespasses and sins. An unsaved man has no connection with God. Once we get saved, the spirit is quick and it's made alive and, we, and, there, and the connection with God is restored. And so Jesus, when he says uh, that he is troubled in spirit, he's talking about something that has to do with the connection with God there. Now consider the context of the passage. Jesus, remember Jesus chose his 12 apostles after spending an entire night in prayer. He, this is not something, he didn't just go you, 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 and you know, pick them like that. He spent an entire night in prayer. And, and at the end of, um, of a night of prayer, uh, communing with his heavenly father, um, the, the, the 12 apostles are, are chosen. And they're, they're chosen uh, to be the, they're going to be the foundation of Jesus' church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So he builds his own church. But he builds it upon a foundation that is laid of the apostles and prophets, is what uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. So these are important men. These 12 are, are important men. And yet out of the 12, men that he's prayed for, men that he personally selected, men who are to be the foundation of his church, out of those 12, Jesus said his spirit is troubled because one of them is going to betray him. Once again, the concern is, is not uh, uh, that he, he's not concerned that he's going to be crucified. He came for the purpose of crucifixion. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to die for you and I. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. No, He came for this purpose. Jesus didn't leave heaven to say, you know, I, I'm, all right, God, uh, all right, Father, I'll go to this earth and uh, begrudgingly, I'm not really wanting to do this thing, but I'll go to the earth if you want me to and because uh, you love the world, I'll come down there and I'll live among them and I'll live a, a righteous life and and I'll pray and I'll select my apostles and, uh, and maybe, God, if this thing works out just right, you can, uh, I can slide by and not be crucified. It's not at all it. The entire purpose of his coming is so that uh, he can die for us. God commended his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he's not, his, his trouble, his, his concern is not that he is going to be crucified, but... <clears throat> the one who's going to betray him is someone who, who claims to be one of his disciples, who claims to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is troubled in spirit, I'd like to suggest to you, and I'm, and I'm relatively certain that, I am, that I'm on track with this. Jesus is troubled in his spirit because Judas doesn't know him, doesn't believe Jesus. Jesus is troubled in his spirit because Judas doesn't know him as his savior. Jesus is troubled in his spirit because Judas' spirit, Judas's spirit was not alive. He didn't have a relationship with God. That's what's troubling Jesus. Um, so we've got John chapter uh, um, 12 is Jesus' troubled soul. John chapter uh, 13, he's troubled in his spirit. Uh, John chapter 15, 14, he's troubled in, and he talks about the troubled heart, but um, I, I just, it's going to throw my little uh, progression off a little bit, but there is another passage of scripture that speaks about Jesus having a troubled spirit. It's John chapter 11 and verse 33. I'm not going to take you to that, but that's the, where Lazarus has died. Remember, um, uh, they told him he was sick, and instead of, uh, you know, going to Lazarus immediately and, and healing him of his sickness, Jesus uh, delays his coming, and Lazarus dies. And by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus has been dead and buried for four days. I mean, he's um, dead, dead. And there, there's a reason for the four days. There was a kind of a Jewish tradition in those days. You know, the person, uh, you know, you could call, in fact, I think this went on, uh, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of, um, superstition might not be the right word, but um, a lot of people were pronounced dead at, at a time, at a certain time in history. A lot of people who were, were pronounced dead before they were dead. 
That's the, like the whole idea of that, about awake, you know. You, uh, the idea is you're just going to stay and watch just in case the person wakes up, you know. We're not going to bury them until we know that they're dead, dead, dead. And so uh, the Jews, just three days was enough to know. And four, when a guy's been dead four days, uh, his sister's going to say, by this time he stinketh. The body's beginning to decay by this time. His body is beginning to decay. And so there's a reason why, uh, you know, they, they, so Jesus has waited until Lazarus is dead. He's been in the grave for four days. And um, when he gets there, so he, now he comes and um, he comes and he begins to, he, he, he comes to Martha first. And, and Martha, you know, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Didn't, it had all been good. Jesus speaks to her about the resurrection and life. Do you believe me that, uh, you know, if a person believes that, do you believe? If you believe me, uh, uh, that you have eternal life. Yeah, yeah, Lord, I know in the resurrection. And uh, she, you know, she believes, but there's kind of some doubt going on and, uh, in her heart. And then she goes to Mary, and it's the same sort of, same, same sort of, of, uh, of conversation of you you'd been here he would have not died and and we wouldn't have to suffer this loss and we wouldn't have this pain and we wouldn't be going through this thing if you'd just been here he wouldn't have died yes but do, don't you remember mary what the promise is i know i'm paraphrasing but these are the conversations he's having with him don't you remember the promise about uh, resurrection don't you remember the promise of a life that is uh, that is more life than you'll ever have on this earth don't you remember that promise and and there's concerns about whether jesus I'm all this kind of, and there's a there's an issue with a believer who's not believing, and the Bible says he's troubled in his spirit over those things. Um, it concerns Jesus when a soul is either unsaved or a believer is not established in their faith, not strong. It concerns Jesus in his spirit. When a believer isn't as strong in their faith or as they ought to be, or when a person isn't saved. You know, if you're a child of God and your spirit has been quickened, if your spirit's been made alive by the Holy Spirit of God, it ought to trouble you that there are people who would betray um, the church that Jesus loves. It ought to trouble you uh, that there are people who would hurt the cause for which Jesus died. It ought to trouble you that there are people who would sell out for something more comfortable in this world. It ought to trouble you that there are people who claim to be Christians but are false believers. Believers. It ought to trouble you that there are lost souls in this world. You know, America, uh, they, you know, uh, they still say that most Americans claim to be Christians, but that doesn't mean most Americans are Christians. It ought to trouble you that there are people who think they're saved and are not saved. It ought to trouble you that there are lost souls. It ought to trouble you that there is such a thing as a Christian uh, who, uh, who is not established in his faith, her faith and his faith. It ought to trouble you that there are people who are not faithful to the Lord. It ought to trouble you that there are people who don't who are believers but don't spend time communing with God in prayer and in the word of God it ought to trouble you that there is such a thing as a believer who is not faithful to the house of God it ought to trouble you in your spirit that those things can happen that there that there is such a thing as that notice what Jesus did in this case he's talking about uh, Judas Iscariot and uh, you know one of them is going to betray me in this case what Jesus did is he separated from him He's troubled in his spirit. One of his own is going to betray him, and he separates from Judas. Sorry, Judas, Judas left, and and uh, you know they're there at the uh, Passover slash Lord's Supper is all going to happen there, and and uh, in the context of John chapter thirteen, and Judas left, and from reading the other Gospels, I believe Jesus left. I'm sorry, I believe that Judas left previous to. Uh, Previous to observing the Lord's Supper, that he was not there uh, to receive the Lord's Supper. Right? At least that's the way that I understand uh, the scriptures. But um, so we got Jesus. He tells uh, he is troubled in his soul, and Jesus is troubled in his spirit. But Jesus tells his disciples, "Let not your heart be troubled." Um, I'm going to. I'm just suggesting if. It's okay for Jesus to be troubled in the soul. It's okay for us to be troubled in our soul. If it's okay for Jesus to be troubled in his spirit, it's okay for you and I to be troubled in our spirit. But Jesus specifically told the disciples on two, two different times in chapter 14 to let not your heart be troubled. We ought not let our heart be troubled. Now the soul is that part of us that connects with our surroundings, the nature. The spirit is that part of us that connects with, um, with God. The heart 
is the seat of our affections. Um, so, like, troubled in soul has to do with being concerned for God's glory. Troubled in spirit has to, be, has to do with being concerned for the souls of men. Troubled in the heart has to do with being concerned for personal comfort and well-being. Has to do with your affections, the things that you love, personal type of things. And twice in John chapter 14, Jesus urged his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. The, the wording of Jesus' instruction tells me, oh, I want to just say this also. All right, so um, how in the world then I'm not supposed, I should, I should be troubled in my soul for God's glory. I should be troubled in my spirit for souls, but I should not be troubled in my heart. How do I know, uh, how can I tell which troubled is, trouble is which? And I would just suggest this, that troubled in soul and spirit is troubled for something Something or someone else, trouble in heart is for me personally. If what my concern is for me, my comfort, my well-being, what, you know, my life, you know, my safety, um, you know, uh, my success, my name, my reputation, that's heart. When I care for somebody else, when I care for the cause of Christ, that's the soul and that's the spirit. So anyway, getting back, the wording of Jesus' instruction tells me this. It tells me that, um, that being troubled of heart is a choice that can be made. Let not your heart be troubled. So that his disciples had a, an option here. They could either let their heart be troubled or they could let not their heart be troubled. It was their choice. Um, they didn't have to have a troubled heart, but, uh, and there were, there were choices that they could make that would, that would lead to a heart that is not troubled, but there are other choices that, to make that would lead to a heart that is troubled. And it might be easier to say that there were choices you could make that would, that would lead to an untroubled heart, but it, not to make those choices just means your heart is going to be troubled in this world. And so uh, it was up to them. Um, they had reason to be troubled in their day, no question about it. Um, if we're talking about trouble, the seed of the affections, things being troubled for things that of the heart having to do with uh, safety and comfort and uh, reputation and name and things like that. They, they, these guys have the reason to be troubled. I mean, um, plans are being made to take their, their leader, Jesus, and crucify him. And, and, um, and they know that they're not going to be far behind there. And we know that after Jesus was crucified, they huddled themselves together in an upper room. And, and they, did, they were concerned about whether they would survive. We do know that not long after, um, uh, after Jesus was crucified, it's after the day of Pentecost, so it's 50 days or so, but a little bit longer than that. Uh, then we do know that uh, Stephen was, uh, was stoned to death and James was beheaded. And we do know that, uh, that persecution came under Saul of Tarsus. We know that they, they had reason to be troubled and concerned for their safety. They had reason to be troubled and concerned for their reputations and their comfort and, and, uh, and, and all of those. Sort of, they had reason to be troubled for those kind of things. John chapter 13, Jesus had informed them that he was going to be betrayed, that he would be betrayed by one of them. And even that could trouble them, you know. One of you is going to betray me. Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Isn't that some? That is telling. These are the, the 12 chosen by Jesus. And when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, not only did they not know it was Judas, you'd have thought, you know, obviously. I mean, if Jesus told me one of you is going to betray me, I've got a list. I mean, I, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke. And so, but, uh, but not only did they not know it was Judas or even suspect it was Judas, they all come, is it me? They didn't even know their own heart well enough to know if they were capable to betray Jesus or not. So they've got reasons to be troubled. He would be betrayed. He'd be betrayed by one of them, and they didn't know which one it would be. John chapter 13 uh, ends um, this way. This is the verses 37 and 38. 
uh, talking about, you know, being troubled, having a reason to be troubled. John 13, verses 37 through 38, Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down my, thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Peter, um, and, and at this point, I'm not positive that Peter knew that it's Judas who's going to betray Jesus, but Jesus says, Peter, for this night's over. You're going to deny me, not once, not twice, three times. I'd be troubled. Yeah. So when we get to John chapter 14... It begins with those words, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus. All of those things have happened. You know, there's the whole Passover and the Lord's Supper and uh, Judas has gone out and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and Jesus has told them that one of them is going to betray him, that he's going to be leaving. Uh, he's said to Peter, you know, you're going to deny me three times. And, and all of that's happened and after, saying, after saying that, but, at, but let not your heart be troubled. Uh, it's a, listen, to have an untroubled heart is a choice that we make. And I think John chapter 14 tells us how to choose an untroubled heart. I think we're gonna, we can learn from John 14 how not to let our heart be troubled. First of all, um, the untroubled heart comes through faith. So let me read all of John 14 and verse 1. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. So it doesn't just end with let not your heart be troubled. He continues on. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Now this simple verse, it's actually, this simple verse is actually more critical, I think, than most of us ever kind of give it credit for. It's one of those passages that we all know when we hear. It's a kind of a favorite. You know, it's easy to quote. It's easy to say. Um, it's easy to remember. And, is, and, it, and we find comfort in it, so it's pretty easy to say it. Uh, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. It's just kind of an easy one for us to get. And because it's simple, and because it's easy to, to hold on to like that, I think we, sometimes we, we miss the depth that is in the verse. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people believe in God. The Bible says in the book of James that even the devils believe in God. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe in trouble. Um, but Jesus connected faith in God to faith in himself. You believe in God, believe also in me. I know it hasn't been too long ago that I preached, maybe even a couple of messages that I preached on where I, 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 I pointed out this connection that a genuine faith in God the Father requires a true faith in God the Son. If we do not understand Jesus, if we do not have a right faith in Jesus, we miss the Father completely. It doesn't matter what we say. Well, I believe in Jesus, but my, my focus is on the Father. Jesus connects the two very closely together. When you look into this, this chapter further, you see that, that this idea, the connection between God the Father and God the Son becomes a major theme. Look at John 14, verses 7 through 14. He says, If ye had known me, ye should have known that my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. Have you been with me three years? You haven't figured this out? You've seen me, you have seen the Father. He said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he, also, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then he says, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So a few things here. First of all, notice this relationship between Jesus and the Father. Now, I want to just say this. Um, Jesus, God the Son, God the Father are not the same person, but they are the same God. Um, 
there are three that bear record in heaven. God the Father, God the Son, uh, God the Word, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They are not the same person. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are not the same person, but they are all one God. Um, there is a growing movement within independent Baptist churches um, where a doctrine is built on a particular passage in uh, Isaiah 9 and verse 6 where the Bible says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is give, given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There is a growing movement in independent Baptist churches today that say since Isaiah 9, 6, that says that the, the child that is, that is born will be called the Everlasting Father, that Jesus Christ is the Father. There are, it's an internet phenomenon. And young independent fundamental Baptists are buying into it every day now. Uh, I had reason this week to spend some time uh, doing just a little bit of research on this for somebody else. And, uh, and this group, it, now they call themselves the New Independent Fundamental Baptists. And, uh, and uh, the leader of Stephen Anderson claims that, in, so now I, don't, I tried not to say his name because I don't want you to look him up. And uh, he says, I want, I'm, my goal is to make it when, when, so that whenever anyone thinks independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist, they think of me. And my doctrines, and he says that God the Father, based on Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, that Jesus is God the Father. Jesus uh, is God, but he is not the Father. The Father is God, but he is not the Son or the Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all three individual persons, but they all three make one God. Explain that, Pastor. I can't. I'm just telling you that's what the Bible says. So here's what a guy does, though, is you take a passage of Scripture and say, wow, look at that, that says this. And then what you do is you begin twisting the rest of the Bible to make it sound like it agrees with what you think you see in that verse. You don't use the, Bi you don't use the Bible to uh, prove what you believe. You use the Bible to discover what you should believe. There's a difference between the two. Jesus is the express image of God the Father, and no man comes to God, to the Father, but by Him. Um, so there is a close relationship. There are two different persons, but there is a close relationship between God the Father and God the Son. You cannot get to God the Father except through God the Son. So there's that relation. Notice, secondly, the importance of faith. The importance of faith. And I, I find the word, I'm not going to read it again, verses 7 through 17. I find the word believe or some form of believe at least four times. I counted it several times. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just miss. I, I find it at least four times, the word believe, in verses 7 through 17. So here, here's the thing. There's a lot of difference between knowing a thing and believing it. I'm afraid a ton of churchgoers in the United States of America know what the Bible teaches about God, about Jesus, about heaven, about hell, about being saved, but they don't believe it. They don't trust it. Philip seemed to be having some of that problem in his own life right now when Jesus is talking about this. And so he says in verse 8, Philip says, just show us and it will suffice us. Show us the, just, Jesus, show us the Father. You show this thing to us. You show us the Father, and that'll satisfy us. Um, and I, I, want some, I want some sight on this thing, Lord Jesus. You, you, want, you say you don't want my heart to be troubled, and I don't want my heart to be troubled either, but I'm going to have a troubled heart, Philip is um, implying, I think, in this passage. I'm going to have a troubled heart until you show me some evidence, show me some proof. I've got to see the Father. If you'll show me the Father, I'll be satisfied. I'll stop belly aching. I'll stop whining about them. Here's the thing. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. And I'm afraid that if you can't be satisfied without some, for some form of physical evidence, your heart will have to stay troubled. If you, can't, if you can't learn to believe God for what he says in his word, if you can't learn to trust him and believe him and lean upon what he promises in his word, I'm just going to tell you, you're going to live the rest of your life with a troubled heart. 
You're gonna, you're gonna, you're, he's not going to suffice you. He's not going to show you something that says, oh, well, now that I've seen that, it's all good. It'll never happen. Until the, until the day Jesus comes to take you to heaven, you're going to need to live by faith. You're going to need to walk by faith. You're going to need to believe what he says in his word. Notice also um, there in this passage there is a section that has to do with answer to prayer. Look at verses 13 through 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I just want to say, when your faith begins to result in answers to prayer, that's going to help settle your heart. Now, I've been, I've been a believer very close to 40 years right now. And I keep a list of answers to prayer. Forty years, uh, I have a list of answers to prayer. And uh, I have a list of things that I'm praying for, <clears throat> but I have a list of, of, of things that I prayed for and God has answered. And some of them, you know, I mean, in unbelievable ways, in miraculous ways, I call them miracles. I got a list of miracles and, uh, that I keep and I remind myself. And you know why I keep it and remind myself? Because it's not like I get those kinds of answers every day. Um, but it sure is nice when you call out to the Father a specific prayer and you get a specific answer. Jesus, what he said, here's the thing, is you come to the Father through me, and when you come to the Father through by by you and come to the Father by me, there's salvation, and then believe me, that's faith and trust. I'm going to live my life walking by faith, and when you do that, you'll find answers to your prayers. And that's going to help settle your heart so that it's not troubled. Number two, uh, first of all, uh, there is um, this, this issue of faith. So you, your heart is, is untroubled through faith. Number two, your heart is Untroubled through, and I'm going to, because I'm trying to keep with, um, you know, uh, alliteration through faith, the next one's through a fortification, through a fortification. Look at verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and so I think this, he says, all right, you're going to pray and I'll give you answer to your prayers, and while you're praying, I'm going to pray too. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So speaking of prayer, Jesus said he'd be praying for us. He's praying for us right now. He said he'd pray to, to the Father and that when he prayed to the Father, his Father would give us another comforter. And we know that comforter be the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, chapters 14, j chapter 14 tells us a little bit about the comforter. Chapters 15 and 16 gives us a little bit more teaching and lessons uh, on the comforter. But here's what we learn. Chapter 14, we learn these two things about the comforter. Number one, that the comforter, the Holy Spirit, represents for us the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verses 16 through 18. I will pray the Father and he'll shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And then he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Jesus comes to us through the comforter of the Lord Jesus, uh, through the comforter of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus said um, in um, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, the Bible says, um, uh, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Uh, the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, the last uh, phrase of Matthew 28 and verse, uh, and verse 20. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And Jesus keeps both of those promises. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And, and the promise, lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. He keeps those promises through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, through the indwelling of the Spirit of God in our lives. He never leaves us or forsakes us. The Holy Spirit of God represents Jesus in our life today, represents He is there in, in Jesus' stead for you and I today. And the second thing that we learn about the Holy Spirit in John 14 is that He teaches us and reminds us of the Word of God. Teaches us the Word of God and reminds us of the things that we've learned. In verses 25 and 26, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So, um, have you ever um, sat in a class, maybe, 
I can think of a lot of scenarios where this, where this thing can play out. But maybe you're sitting in a class where the teacher taught so much stuff that was so much over your head that you just didn't even know where to begin taking notes. You just and the class. I used to teach like when I taught at Bible college, you know, I just I told everyone you have to take notes, but you know, I don't know if anyone knows I talked really, really fast. And so they'd come up and they'd say, Would you you need to repeat yourself, raise your hand? And because I put I prepare a lot of stuff, so they'd raise their hand, could you repeat that? Could you repeat that? No, I cannot repeat that. I only have forty five minutes. If I'm going to teach this lesson, i got to get, get it done. And then just pay attention. Keep up with me. And they'd come up afterwards and say, well, you know, Ken, I just didn't get half your notes. Well, go find someone who got the, who you got this half and find someone who got the other half. And then you put your halves together and you'll have it. I, and in fact, I still think that's a good way to learn. I think what students should do is after they sit through a lecture, they ought to get together and discuss the lecture. Compare notes, add notes, and complete there. That way they're learning that way too. But that's just me because none of them wanted to do it. They wanted me to give them a fill in the blank and put it up on the board so that I would, and, and that they could raise their hand and tell me when I forget to flip the button. And the, Brother Fred, I'm just picking on you. <laughs> that's, that's you. So they wanted to have so they, just one word and then the, and stop me right now. You forgot to flip the slide there for me and that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, that's what they wanted. And no, okay, who wants to learn? We just want to have the answers given to us. And, and all right, Brother Fred. Anyway, so I'll just, so you, you know, you, you've been in that class, you know, you just, you just didn't have an idea what to do. Jesus said that he had, Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit would come live with them and that um, he has all Jesus' notes with him. All those things Jesus taught, when the Holy Spirit comes inside, He'll teach you all those things and remind you of the things that I said. The Holy Spirit living in you can teach you what the Bible says. So you get the whole Bible and you open it up and you say, man, this just, I don't understand this at all. But you keep reading it, trust in the Holy Spirit of God, trust in God, and he will teach you the word of God. And then what will happen is that some point uh, you'll need a scripture. You've been studying your, the Bible and you've been learning the Bible and you feel like, man, I just don't get any of this and I don't understand most of it, I don't get any of it. And then one day what will happen is you'll have a need, something to happen in your life, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God will remind you of a verse. Oh, hey, I know a verse that fits this thing. I know. See, that's the Spirit of God taking the Word of God, teaching it to you, and then bringing it back up and reminding you when you need it so that you don't have to let your heart be troubled. God doesn't ever leave you. God doesn't ever forsake you. He is, right, he is there to comfort you and to guide you and to teach you. So that you never have to, you know, look at his Bible and say, man, I'm not, I would never be able to get this. No, he's there to teach it to you. And, and uh, just, you don't have, you have no reason to let your heart be troubled. Through faith and through fortification, the Holy Spirit of God. And then finally, we don't need to let our heart be troubled. Uh, we can have an untroubled heart through, and I'm going to call it a future hope. Look at, back to John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I know this is, I wanted to save this for the last. I know, you know, if I was going to do it in order, this would have been real, one of the first things I did. But I want to save it for last because it's just one of those things. Yeah, it's, one, it's that thing I want to, for you to keep fresh in your mind the longest. And so, and Jesus, Jesus gives us a promise, a future hope here. So Jesus describes his father's house in my father's house. He describes his father's house, heaven. I, I debated whether I ought to say that. Now, you know, it says in my father's house, and should I try to uh, make a distinction between the father's house and heaven? I don't think there is a distinction. So should I try to prove to you that the father's house is heaven? And I decided that rather than doing that, I'll just tell you the father's house is heaven. And, but look at the description he gives. Number one, he describes the father's house as, uh, as palatial. My father's house are many mansions. He uses the word mansion. So I spent a little time looking up that, you know, because um, someone will tell you, if you do much study, and someone will tell you, well, what he really meant was apartments. That, that, that the Greek here is dwelling place, an apartment. <clears throat> and uh, um, so I, I wanted to, but the word of God, my Bible says, in my father's house are many mansions. 
And uh, so I wanted to look that up and uh, so find out what a mansion is. And here's what I, this is a modern, um, I thought about calling and getting, so getting I, 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 since I happen to know an expert in this field, I thought about seeing if I could get some expert um, uh, opinion on this definition. This is from a realtor website that I found, and, uh, the realtor's definition of mansion. According to some experts, the modern-day man modern mansions are houses whose floor area is more than 8,000 square feet and have all the desired comforts and stylishly built to grab the, attentions, uh, the, uh, the attention of onlookers. So, I thought, <laughs> more than 8,000 square feet. I'm not telling you that you've got an 8,000 square foot home in heaven. That's not what I'm saying. Just saying, but the whole idea, uh, what, the point I think I, that, that the Bible is trying to say is that your home in heaven is nice. It's just nicer, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be nicer than anything you can imagine it being. I've told you my story. My idea of a home, my mansion in heaven, I don't know what your, your mansion in heaven is going to look like. Mine is going to be 40 acres in the middle of Arizona. Doesn't have to even be square, eight thousand square feet as long as the living room has a high to, has a lazy boy chair with a fishing stream right in front of it, so I can sit there on my lazy boy and and catch trout. That's all I want to do. I don't know what I don't know what they're like. I, that's silly. I know it is, and that's silly. But Cambridge, here's Cambridge. The the Cambridge English Dictionary says that a mansion is a very large, expensive house. <laughs> and Jesus said, "Your father's house has many of them." It's palatial. <laughs> Not only is it palatial, Jesus describes it as prepared. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, um, that's not a troubling statement, that he goes to prepare a place. And I try to think of some illustrations of this, too. Um, you know, when someone goes and prepares something for you, does it concern you? Um, you know, when you were growing up and you're... Um, you're uh, mom said, I'm going to go and prepare your bed for you. Um, and I thought, I know some kids who would panic at that. Oh, no, it's bedtime. But, uh, you know, the whole idea of, you know, you know I'm going to go make your bed for you. I'm going to go prepare your bed for you. Is that something that can, I mean, that's nothing to be concerned about. It's not like, oh, no, she's never coming back. What am I going to do? You know, she's going to be gone. And I'm going to be alone. Well, she, you know, you don't get panicked over in fear and dread when your mom says she's going to go prepare. Maybe this would be better when she says, I'm going to go prepare dinner for you. Maybe that'll excite you. I'm going to go prepare your pizza for you. That might excite someone even more than dinner. But, uh, uh, you know, you don't get feared because she's going to go to prepare something for you. You don't, you don't get all scared about that. And, uh, and, and uh, here's the thing. When Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, there should be something comforting about that. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And then I'm going to come again. That ought to be comforting. Have you placed saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Then trust his promise. He is right now preparing a place for you. Yeah, just trust him. You know, no, he didn't, he didn't die in this cruel world. They killed him, and no, now because they killed him, they're going to kill all of us off too. This world hates, hated Jesus, hates me, and so life is bad. It's going to be terrible, terrible, terrible. And I can't wait to escape it. No, he went on purpose. He came on purpose to be our sacrifice so that our sins could be forgiven. And then he left on purpose so that he could prepare a place for you. And he says he's coming again on purpose. This is all his plan, his purpose. It's a good thing. It's all good. So it's palatial, his father's house, what he's describing here. It's palatial uh, and it's uh, prepared. And then the final one, world, I'll be done with this. It's personal because he says this. He says, for you. He says, there are many mansions. It's not just one mansion. There are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. That makes me think he's preparing a mansion for me and a mansion for you. Each one of us gets our own. I'm hoping I get to share Anita's, that we get to go back and forth, you know, like we'll have a summer and a winter or whatever. I'm hoping we get to share. But, but I'll have a mansion and she'll have a mansion. We are, he prepares a place for each one. It's personal. It tells, um, it's, it's personal. So, um, and that tells me, by the way, that, um, that heaven is, you don't lose your personality when you get to heaven. 
Um, so uh, I know everyone in this room must be a Star, uh, Star Wars fan, right? Remember the Force? <laughs> Remember the Force? You die and you become one with the Force? It's not like when you die, you all just become one with the big Force. We all just become this blob of Force out there. I don't know what that force would look like, you know, nirvana and all those kind of things. I don't know what the force looks like, you know, and what, but I just picture it as a blob, you know, this big, and every time someone dies, their, their personality gets shoved into the blob, and it gets bigger, and it's not like that's what heaven, it's not like heaven is just this big blob of, of intelligences and so forth. It's personalities. You maintain your, you retain, when we get to heaven, we retain our individuality, we retain our identity. You'd be surprised how many people ask me this. When I get to heaven, will I know my children? Well, since your children are individuals, and assuming you get to heaven, and they get to heaven, you'll remember them. You'll know as you are known, is what the Bible says. You maintain your individuality, you maintain your identity, you retain your personality. The only difference is, is that in heaven, all of those are perfected. And then when it is in the Father's time, no man knows it, but in the Father's time, Jesus promised, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is coming again. And Jesus is coming for you, and he's coming for me. There's no, there's no reason. There's no reason to let your heart be troubled. Yeah, be concerned that God be glorified in this world. And pray, uh, and pray that um, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray that God's will be done. Pray for God to be glorified. Be troubled about that, and be concerned. Concerned enough to, to, ha to, to take a, 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 an active part in bringing glory to God in this world. Concerned enough to pray uh, that God would be glorified in this world. And be concerned for the souls of men and women and, and that people would be saved. Be concerned enough to pray for them to be saved. And, and, and be concerned enough uh, to witness to people to be saved. And be concerned for those uh, who uh, claim to be children of God but don't live like they ought to live and don't follow the Lord Jesus Christ and live lives... I, to, I'm just going to tell you, in my, my opinion, my opinion is all it is, but my opinion, when a Christian doesn't live like a Christian, he's living like a denier. If a Christian isn't living like a Christian ought to live, he's betraying Jesus. Just my opinion, just my opinion. But, and be concerned about that. But there is no reason to let your heart be troubled. You have a sure faith, you have a constant companion, you have a future promise. You don't have any reason to let your heart be troubled. I said again earlier that the heart is the seat of affection. It's, you know, the, the things that matter to us, the things that we love, and the, and, and the things that we love kind of, we, those things, what happens to the things that we love have a lot to do with our emotions and so forth. The reason we don't want to let our heart be troubled is because it'll change what we love. If our heart gets troubled, we begin to, it begins to change our affection. So Paul, Paul knew a man who had once lived for the Lord and then and been the Lord's been his helper in the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when things got difficult, um, Paul wrote about this man in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, and said, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. I don't know whether Demas was saved or not, or truly saved or not. I do know this though. I know that Demas was a disappointment to the Apostle Paul, and he has been for the last 2,000 years a lesson of what not to let happen to you and me. Don't let your affections get so caught in this world and its troubles and so forth that you forsake the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Heavenly Father, I want to ask you now that your Holy Spirit will bless as we finish the message this morning. And Lord, give us untroubled hearts. Um, help us, Heavenly Father, through faith and um, through the companionship, the comfort of the Holy Spirit of God, and um, through that promise and 